Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Life by Design podcast. In this week's episode, I talk with Chris Bale. Chris is a embodied presence, energy worker, qigong, and intimacy mentor. Chris supports and activates deep transformations in the lives of others and has been doing this for over a decade. He's worked with thousands of individuals from all over the planet and from many different walks of life, from coaches to therapists, doctors, celebrities, and CEOs. He has a wide and extensive education in many different modalities, including Chinese medicine, acupuncture, medical qigong, reiki, and sexual alchemy. In this week's episode, we talk about being fully present, new age spirituality, energetics, empaths, and their wounding, building a man's power, desire, and much, much more. Enjoy the episode. Mr. Chris Bale, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I've been a big fan of your work for quite a while, and I find it very unique, and I'm looking forward to exploring your views and your work today. But for those that have no idea about you or the work that you do, in 60 to 90 seconds, could you give a spiel of who you are and what's got you to where you are today? Can I say no? You can say no. It would be the first time anyone said no. But you, you can. <laughs> I mean, I just want to be real in my response because, you know, I get that this is a question that has to be, that has to be asked many cases, but the inner grump in me has had to answer this question hundreds and hundreds of times. So I'm, I'm noticing there's a little bit <clears throat> of like, like, I don't want to do it. <laughs> that immediately comes up, but, but I'm going to give it a go for 60 or 90 minutes. So to kind of preface the, the main type of work that I do, I ultimately do very little. That's just the honest, the honest truth in it. There's not so much that I'm doing versus what I'm representing or what I'm doing my utmost to represent as a way of being here in a way that's <clears throat> aligned and true for me as an individual. But the practical aspect of how that works with other people is for men, there's a lot of waking him up through exposing himself to himself. And all the ways that this conditioned society has kind of stolen him from his beautiful ferocity, from his directness, from his purpose, essentially, and him just being able to stand up straight and being connected to his potency along with his compassion and his his ability to <clears throat> engage with intimacy in his life. So a lot of it is approaching him in a way that exposes him and returning back to his integrated self because we come here integrated. That there is no one that comes here not completely perfect the way that they are. So I'm kind of helping de-brainwash the man through seeing him and through sharing with him what I see. The other side of the work is with women and that is very much energetically based in order to evoke, wake up and allow for a lot of feeling and letting go within our own system. And a lot of the time the trauma that has been done onto women has come directly from the hands of men so it has been quite a beautiful and challenging process to be a man in the room and allow a lot of that stuff come up for purging and for releasing. I can never do anything in 60 or 90 minutes. So uh, that's my best attempt. And the, the background for my work is based in Chinese medicine or traditional Chinese medicine as a practice. My original trade is as an acupuncturist and then everything just kind of evolved from there as I worked with people and went through different seasons of, of my own life. So that is 
one version of it. There is another 155 versions of it, but that's what came out today. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to do that against your will as well. I uh, It was quite succinct. You mentioned the waking up. So I guess we'll start with men. And my understanding potentially when men hear that is like this brash, shouting, screaming, but in as an observer of your work, it's such a subtle potion and so almost poetic the way that you go about your work as an observer. How do you, in your own unique way, wake men up? By being as awake as I can be when I'm with him. Wakefulness will stir wakefulness in another person. There is nothing more terrifying than all your bullshit being seen or all your trauma being seen or all the things that you're trying to hide being seen. And and that kind of does the work for everybody. So what I love about how this work has chosen to come through in many ways is I'm very much out of the picture. I'm as out of the way as I can possibly be. And I'm just there being in presence. And that presence starts to stir the waking up. In my experience, everything here is energetic first. And I don't mean that from this like woo-woo, new age spiritual context. To me, it's, it's very palpable. It is undeniable to see the impact in another person when a person who is carrying energy sits down beside a person who is maybe deficient. So all of this has been shown to me in many, many different ways throughout my life, subtly and very, very obviously. But it's getting to a point where I can't really take so much credit for for where I am, what happens. I just keep trying to do as little as possible and to share what I see. That's 20% of what I see is impactful. The rest is how I am being, what energetic frequency I'm carrying with me as a man. Am I allowing myself to be here as a man? Because most men are not allowing themselves to be here as men. They're watering themselves down. They're lying because... He's been manipulated by a society. He's been domesticated. He's been told that he's the problem. So now the level of guilt, shame, fear that a man has just for his own male essence cuts him off from everything. So I refuse to be here as anything other than what I am. I'm not here to impress someone, to be a coach for someone. I'm going to be me with everyone that I come in contact with, and that will either support them or it will trigger them. Both is kind of the same anyway. But there's a lot of bravado that I feel a lot of coaches and spiritually identified leaders have. And most of the stuff out there is just nonsense. Most of the spiritual terrain right now on social media is complete bullshit. It's overcomplicated, and it's even being pushed from wounded. Now, we're very simple. The work is very simple. Be present, feel, and allow yourself to be expressed. Oh, but that's uncomfortable. Beautiful. Figure out how to stay present, feel, and be expressed. I don't know, should I express that here? Interesting. Why? Why do you not feel you can say who you are or how you feel in this scenario, but you can over in that scenario? Mm. What value system are you tying yourself up in as a man in order to be appeased by everyone around you? Because you didn't come here like that. So it's shining as much light as possible on things that really are just common sense. Like nothing I say is profound. It, it, everything that I say, I try to keep it as simple as possible. The only reason I get reflections from some people that 
oh, that's amazing the way that you said that, is the result of how confused our way of being raised, our society, our culture has made us. It's because of how disconnected we've become. So it's to remind everybody of as much simplicity as possible. There's not a million steps. There's not 16 practices to developing spiritually. It's easy. Can you be in your body right here? Relax into yourself. Feel and follow your energy. If a person has difficulty, that's the spiritual work. Understanding why they have been taught to hate themselves that much. And now figuring out, well, what's the medicine to that? That's not complicated either. That's just you staying with yourself in the experience of the self-hatred and touching yourself and blessing yourself with your breath and staying there and putting your arms around yourself and having compassion towards the tension you feel inside and the fear that the person feels inside. All of that is the spiritual work and it's always the same points. But we veered into the intergalactic fucking realm of, of so much nonsense. And I've been doing work like this in this regard and other versions of it for 2010 is when I first started working with people in acupuncture. So it's about 13 years. And through these cycles, I've seen different phases of different trends coming in and coming out. And right now, it's very much this new age, self-pleasure your way to a six-figure business. And it's, it's becoming ridiculous. And it's really important to me that I express the fact that there's so much nonsense out there because it's, it's catching people. And that's not an attempt to have a person believe me or come my direction. Ideally, I would be obsolete so I can stay in my cave and just do my thing. But it's just gotten to such an intense level. I don't know if you've seen it or if you're aware of the, the parody that's happening at the moment. And I feel there's like 1% of information out there that's really transformative and really helpful but it's going to be so simple. It's not going to be glittery. And that's what I'm attempting to, to communicate more of. As someone who is as attuned and sensitive to energy as you are, what does that look like for you on a daily basis in terms of your own protection? How do you go navigating the world that is? As, as we kind of spoke about briefly off air, Tulum, which was your quiet and happy place, has by the sounds of it become a lot busier. What do you find as the upside and potentially even the challenges in your own experience of someone super attuned and quite sensitive to energy? You can't get away from anything. You can't put your head in the sand. I lived a lot of my earlier life as an alcoholic and a drug addict, functional. I was a DJ for many years. And that lifestyle brings a whole lot of free everything. And that was my attempt as an incredibly, so I'm not going to use the word sensitive in this regard. I'm going to use the word fragile because sensitivity and fragility are mm -hmm different things when, when a lot of people come to me and say oh i i don't want to be even more sensitive i'm already so sensitive it's like no you're fragile sensitivity is, is empowerment fragility is the is the sore kind of like you have the flu experience of feeling energy <laughs> right you're on the beach and the wind is pile driving you and it's you can't ex receive the beauty because you're you're too tender you're 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 too uh, you're too fragile and when i say too fragile that more so is speaking to the fact that there is a deficiency of life force in the body so everything becomes too much for the system so navigating it as sensitive 
Well, as I said, everywhere I am, I have to fully be there. I can't be in small talk that I don't enjoy. I, I can't be in situations that before I would just kind of force myself to, to be in, to not risk an uncomfortable or an awkward scenario of me having to excuse myself. To me, sensitivity holds us accountable because you, you can't get away from the truth of things. It, it's right in front of you and there is no way to avoid it. The benefits are living a life of deep felt sense intimacy and connection with self and others. That's the benefit. The challenge is the conditioning that's pushing up against you and rubbing up against you at all times and feeling everything going on in everybody and having to decipher what's mine and what's what's theirs. And for me, at this relatively early point of my own time here, having a lot of space to be with myself and to be in myself, that has been the most beautiful protection. The way that I see embodiment, because the majority of my work is about be in the body. That's generally what I'm what I'm recommending and what I'm guiding. And, and the energetic work that I'm doing is to support that at all times. Because when we're out of the body or we're stuck in the head, it's like we've left our house and all the doors are open. That's when all of these other experiences and hooks can start to come into us. So my priority from the moment I get out of bed in the morning and my feet touch the ground until I get back into bed is how deeply am I in felt sense contact with the remembrance of my own existence, with the subtle vibratory rate that signifies I am alive right now. Because as soon as someone forgets that, now they're caught up externally. So at the beginning, I had to be a lot more isolated because it was too easy for me to get caught up because my energy was weak. I was very blocked in lots of different parts of the body. So I couldn't really be out there and also be in here. It was either one or the other. So I spent a lot of time with just myself, being in my body, feeling my body, learning how to touch myself in a way that I would open, I realized that, you know, little things that are so significant that I was touching myself in a way that was shutting me down. I was being so unconscious and heavy handed with myself, even in self pleasure, in masturbation with my, with my cock, with my dynamic pole. Like I was just numbing it more and more and more. So I started to realize all these little bits that, oh, I've been shutting myself down. I've been traumatizing myself. I have not been respecting myself. I have judged myself for feeling certain things that I felt. I've judged myself for wanting to move in certain ways or in certain directions, but I've shut my mouth and I put my head down and I've just got in line. So the more time I spent with myself, the more all of this exposure started to, to well up because that's what happens when we start to accumulate more life force. It starts to illuminate all of the programming, the conditioning, the dysfunction, and the shame, guilt, trauma, all of these different things that just lodge in our physical system. Once I had found a steady ground of, okay, I've opened a lot of this stuff. I'm very familiar with being in myself. Then I was able to go out into the world a lot more, be around a lot more people and not be taken. So for me, that, that, was, that was a lot of the process. It's, it's very challenging for a person 
to remember themselves when they never have the space to do so. To try to remember yourself within all of the unconsciousness around us and in your habitual patterns and in your environment. Of course, it can be done, but it's challenging. It's definitely more challenging to do that. I couldn't do that at the beginning. Mm. One of the things you said there, which has actually played on my mind for a while, and I'm fascinated to hear your take on it, you mentioned what's mine and what's theirs. And one of the things that I'm interested in your perspective on is empaths and them feeling everyone's stuff. And in my eyes, potentially at times, not acknowledging what is actually theirs and what is, you know, the empathic picking up of other people's energies, et cetera. How, how do you see that from an empath point of view and how can someone start to get clarity on what is theirs and what is someone else's as opposed to just thinking I'm an empath, I'm picking up everyone else's energy? Hmm. Well, the first step to that, to be able to decipher what's theirs and what's yours is to decipher what's yours. Hmm. And you don't need them for that. You just need to feel you. So come to know everything I had just been speaking about ultimately ties into this point. It's far easier to know what is someone else's when you already know what's yours. And when you spend enough deep quality, felt sense time in your body, where you feel all the different ripples and surges and emotions and currents and different experiences in you, and the different trauma reactions and the the things that steal you into unconsciousness, the more that you can know thyself, the more that you can see what is not of you. And luckily, life, I feel, is set up that way because it's the most empowering way for it to be, right? We, We know ourselves first. The next step is... How do you as an individual allow the circulation of energy and feeling and sensation to move through your being? Because oftentimes if a very sensitive and empathetic person is with another person, they'll start to feel it in their solar plexus. They'll start to feel the other person in the form of tension in themselves. This is where knowing thyself is so important. So you know how to put your hand on yourself or how to go inside with your own awareness and your own consciousness and bring presence and love and compassion to that part of you so that your body can let go of it. Holding on to other people's stuff, what I came to find is most of the time that's happening, especially in people who have been conditioned that it's their fault that another person is in an experience that is, let's say, negative. And it's their responsibility to fix it in that person, right? So empaths generally tend to be people who like to help other people. A lot of empaths are doing that for their own value system, for their own healing, for their own sense of self-worth, I still remember the moment I realized that in my configuration and I was like, what the fuck am I doing? (laughs) Who who do I think I'm here to save? Because I'm not saving anybody. (laughs) And that freed up so much space in me to be in a room with so much shadow and trauma coming up in a way where it just kind of goes in and out. It, It doesn't stick Because if it's stuck, I would probably have about four years in me for this work in total, not 30. That's what I see eat practitioners in life. That's what I see burn people out. This identification with, oh, I have to help and fix the person who's in pain beside me. But of course, you can never fix anything in another person, but you can show up in a way where you're being so free and loving in yourself that you can let all of your love just overflow onto them. 
But that's not a doing. There's no leaning in in that. There's a leaning back. And I, I recommend for all empaths to ask themselves or all people who identify as empaths to, to question their behaviors or why they feel that's what they're here to do or why they feel that's their purpose. This can be a tricky thing and we can trick ourselves blindly. Um, and I feel most of what we think is, is just simply not true. Mm. It's just coping mechanisms. Yeah. You mentioned briefly there earlier the former lifestyle that you used to live around addictions and drugs. What was your breaking point? What was the moment? And how do you go from such a extreme, I guess, from an addiction point of view, numbing, dissociation, et cetera, to the polar opposite end of the spectrum the way that you have? Well, I almost died. Mm. So that the first, time, the first time didn't do it because I wasn't sober enough in the experience. The second time done it and it done it so deeply that I was, I want this to be as accurate as possible, but I, I was pretty much bedridden, unable to digest, eat, defecate, Nobody knew what was wrong with me, rushed in and out of emergency rooms, inner trembling. That went on for about 18 months, which to this point in my life has been the deepest hell that I've ever been in. Now, that 18 months would have went way quicker if I had been willing to let go of my old way of existing. But I'm still still stubborn. I still have a stubborn energy in me. Now I get to play with it and enjoy it a bit more because I can I can see more of it. But then it was it was stubborn to the point where it was it was in no way beneficial to my growth. And the stubbornness actually in that moment came from fear. I didn't want to lose what I had. The stubbornness that I play with today comes from orgasmicness. It's a very different frequency and it's a very different uh, joyousness that, that, it, that it brings up. But that was how I went from A to B. And also to clarify, I mean, from the age of about 14, 15, 16, I was experimenting with meditation. Uh, I was being exposed to acupuncture. My aunts, my uncles were acupuncturists. There was a lot of that going on. Uh, in my immediate family. So it wasn't incredibly black and white. Those 18 months were very black and white. That was out the butthole of one life and, you know, out the out the vagina of a new life. Uh, but up until that point, there was a lot of interweaving in my life. Also acupuncture, Chinese medicine studies. This was all interweaving in a ch- time where I was coming in and out of substance addiction. And, and playing with that. What's your what's your thought on substance addiction? Well, not even substance addiction. Addiction as it stands in terms of, you know, whether you overcome it. You know, obviously you've got the AA school of thought that you don't overcome it. You just manage it. You've got the Gabor Mate who talks about, you know, the majority of it being from childhood trauma. You've got, you know, Anna Lemke now giving another opinion on it with her book, Dopamine Nation. What's your take on it, having experienced it firsthand and and in your line of work? Experiencing what? Addiction? Well, firstly, your experience, but also your belief. Is it curable? How would, you know, if you had someone standing in front of you now from a, you know, who is struggling with addiction, would what what modality or or what school of thought would you take in, in terms of helping them manage it or overcome it if you think it is possible to be overcome? I mean, that would be a long conversation of me asking them a lot of questions and, mm-hmm. and feeding into them. Uh, I don't have a systematic answer for that question because I'm I'm never actually really answering the question. I'm answering the questioner. If two people have a headache, both people will get a different answer from me for it to be effective. <clears throat> but 
I can speak from from my experience of it was because I was so excruciatingly uncomfortable in myself in every way, absolutely from I had a beautiful childhood, but there's always trauma. Like you're never not going to experience a parental figure projecting or domineering or shutting down or letting you be over free and then you feeling not loved, but like there's a whole, you can't do anything right, <laughs> right? We, we require trauma to develop in this beautiful process of life. Uh, so however the configuration of my design as an individual, the things I experienced as I was younger, my sensitivity for me to try to be more like the people around me, and also growing up in an Irish culture, alcohol was the first thing. So 11, 12, that's when alcohol started. And it was kind of normal. Like it, 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 it wasn't unusual, but because it relieved the part of me that I had such deep discomfort with, I went hardcore into it as a form of medication. And I remember in a nightclub I used to work in as a DJ, I would arrive into work and my boss would look at me and go, Chris, before you start, have your medicine. And my medicine meant four gigantic pints of beer and throw them back and potentially a few lines. And, and then I was, then social Chris was here. Then bypassed Chris was available to, to, to make the night better for people. So that was the reason that I did it. That was that was my reason. And it's such a huge scope that I think can be approached from so many different angles that I need the person in front of me who's asking the question for me to actually be able to give any type of practical guidance. But what it ultimately comes down to, I feel, for everybody is the fear of slash unwillingness to slash lack of education in how to feel our feelings. Because the moment that that thing happened when they were a child, maybe they were told to shut up. Maybe they were told, don't tell anyone or I'm going to fucking kill you, which I've heard from many men and women who were at the hands of sexual abuse. They were threatened as children and they carry that with them. But if that was felt and shaken off and someone of intelligence and love and compassion was able to hear them and say, oh yeah, that was a dysfunctional behavior. This is not something you deserve in your life. Feel everything that that made you feel. And I'm gonna hold you as you do it and kiss on you and love on you. If that's the way we were all raised, then there wouldn't be so much, so much of this happening. But when we put our head down and kind of hide our soul and feel like we're not valuable, this is when we start to pick up all these different vices. But I also know close to nothing about it. Um, everyone is so intricate. That's what I've realized from working with people. The more I work with people, the more I realize I don't know anything. Every person is, is, is sharing with me their own process and what is right for them. And my role in that is to stay as conscious and as present as possible so I can like help them lay out the next stone. But I don't know four stones ahead. I just know the stone that might be helpful next. And if we can approach our development and our healing in that type of way, practically, without all the self-development jargon of like, heal your life. It's like, you're never gonna heal your life, but can you come to accept it? Because from there, life gets a lot sweeter and we can be a lot kinder to ourselves and other people. Mm -hmm. And now more than ever with social media, everyone's out there thinking that they need to be fucking perfect because mm -hmm. everyone looks perfect mm. that's why mental health is just when you think about your own experience just to kind of i guess close the loop on that 
and as someone who appears at least to be extremely regulated these days and obviously you know presence is such a big part for you with the amount of work that you've done through the different modalities do you still feel addictive tendencies or do you feel like that they've they've fallen away and you don't feel really kind of called to any addictive tendencies as yourself as opposed to obviously anyone else but your own personal experience i feel the fire mm. it's just fire it's just our individual ability to to be beautifully illuminated and turned on and activated so it's a it's more about how do we take that fire and build a better relationship with the fire mm. versus with the thing that the fire is trying to get us to move towards that's why a practice as I was going to say as simple as semen retention, but I, I take that back. <laughs> and that's why taking a, a, a relationship or a way of living for a man at holding his excitement or containing his essence, that is such a beautiful metaphor for any type of addiction because it's so easy for us to follow that, to release, to get a quick pump, and then ultimately to fall off the edge of the cliff after that experience. But if we can show up in relationship to the fire and to the desire, desire is beautiful. Shadow is beautiful when we bring it into the light. The things that will or can or have the potential to hurt us or other people through us, if we can bring consciousness to them, they can, they can change your entire life, your entire experience of it. So for me, that fire is always there. If I was to lose consciousness, it would show up in dysfunctional patterns. If I can stay conscious and present and love it by feeling it, then I can start to support it in leveling itself out. So rather than a huge blaze, I can actually have it be a steady, prolonged burn. So for me, I'm actually looking to seduce the fire, to seduce the addiction. Voice in that throat. Walking uh, of which. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that runs perfectly into my next question and thought. Because what you said there was, I think anyway, quite profound. But for a lot of blokes, they might not have grasped the concept or the concepts that you're talking about. But you, you talk about semen retention. You talk about sitting with, which for, I was going to say a lot of men, but I'll say it's definitely not a, exclusive to, to men as, a, as an issue. But what's that process or, or where do you even start as you start to create a different relationship with your feelings, a different relationship with your emotions as opposed to looking for an outlet, looking for a way to blow off steam, looking away for, you know, to blow, like where does someone start? Because that initial integration or the embodiment of sitting with is terrifying for a lot of blokes. Where, where does one start with that process? Right there. Perfect. Right, <laughs> right in the terror of it, mm. deep in the terror of it. But from the, from the approach uh, of understanding it as, the more feeling that I have access to, the more feeling, sensation, even if it's overwhelmed, even if it's experienced as anxiety, it, anxiety is just a word. This is energy. This is an electrical current that most of us are not comfortable with because of how contracted, disassociated, and pushed out we are from feeling and from our life force from our bliss, from our orgasmicness, that's just naturally pumping through us if we allow it, because that's just our way of being here. And I'm not the first person to say that. It's been said for thousands and thousands of years by many, many people, right? We are orgasmic and we are intended to be overflowing with energy. So from an energetic perspective, how does a man be powerful, because that's all we're interested in. Men just want to know, I want to be powerful. I'll either do it in a dysfunctional way, 
to get a reflection of, oh, you're powerful, which means you're alive. As well. Or I'll go a conscious way, which can still be dysfunctional because it can be a disguise, right? That slippery dude in spirituality who you can never quite grab. He just slips through your fingers. He's also using that as a mechanism to probably have sex with women. So within all of these places of unconsciousness and dysfunction, we have a choice of how am I going to approach the innate, fundamental, spiritual desire and resonance for us as men for power, because that is our dynamic force. And the reason that I recommend semen retention and to be in the body and to feel himself is because in my experience and in my opinion, this is the most beautiful, most blessed, most aligned way for a man to truly feel his power without having to do anything. Because we've come here powerful. We've come here with that power imbibing us. That power is just our life forces, just our electricity. Most men, in my experience, at least the ones I've worked with and the ones I see out in the world, are running on fumes. He's not holding any energy. When a man is not holding energy or accumulating energy, he's walking around energetically neutral which is also going to have him feel a whole bunch of stuff about himself inside that's not so pleasant. He's probably going to start becoming very manipulative in order to get his needs met in an attempt to be reflected powerfully by women, especially. So then he starts to do stuff that is not healthy and that is generally using other people for his reflection. So th that is the avenue that that men start to be pulled in when he's running on fumes. And also as men were given pornography because it's very easy to figure him out. If I want a man to be lazy, unmotivated, fearful, let's give him everything he thinks he wants at a click of a button. Let him just empty himself continuously so he never needs to go out into the world, into the streets and actually get present and alert and meet life, it's all there for him on his lap. So now his hormones go out of whack, how he feels about himself. He gets locked in his head. He gets stripped out of his body. He loses connection to his dynamic pole, which is his genitals, because of the abuse that he's putting on it, because he's never actually allowing his energy to accumulate and rise up in him. He just keeps ejaculating it out of his body, or thinking it away through obsessive thought processes, eating shitty food, it's endless. And this is everything that a good life has been portrayed to us as, right? To be successful, you have all of this. And that's how men are weakened and essentially turned into idiots. We're preyed upon in that way until we lose every morsel of consciousness and we're just getting in line and doing what we're told. So the semen retention piece is just one area where I invite a man to challenge himself in order to feel more of himself, kind of bubbling in him. And the way of doing this is, can you be contained as a man? A man who cannot sit in his own arousal, in his own desire, even right beside a woman, who is activating this desire, this love, this turn on in him. If he is unable to sit in his own containment, he is a dangerous man and not for the right reasons. Because now he's always looking to empty himself for pleasure. And this will also drain a man very, very quickly and support him and line him up for other types of addictive behaviors. So if a man can get right with his own sexual energy and his own relationship to his desire, to his penis, to his feelings around that area of his body, and he can sit in his own containment, now he gets to experience the orgasmicness of himself. There is nothing more orgasmic for a man than feeling himself walking around in this life 
full, charged, vibrating, erect in life, but also supple, sensitive, compassionate, and integrated. And for men to get to that place of true integration, he has to begin with his relationship to his sexual energy, period. I've never seen it being able to be done in any other pattern because energetically as men, our genitals is our dynamic force. It's our positive pole. We have to start there for the first healthy relationship. And if you look at little boys, toddlers, babies, he is getting up in there all the time, running around, touching himself, loving himself, going here for comfort, for stabilization, because he has the innate knowing that this is where his center is till the mother, the father, the people come around and go, don't do that. It's dirty. So now that's that's going to mess up his core relationship quickly. And he's going to start experiencing in puberty when these desires start volcanoing up in him, he's going to start having to hide out in order to be with that beautiful male part of himself. And that's where all of this stuff starts to get really heavy. So they're retaining, if it's done in a healthy way, because there's a lot of ways out there that are being taught that are not healthy. But if it can be approached in a healthy way, this will restore the man's potency, his virility, his sense of himself, and his availability to, to love to receiving, to feeling, to being present with other people. Matt, I could talk to you for hours, but I'm also very mindful of your time. If people want to find out more about you, the work that you do, where's the best spot for them to find you? Mm, so I, I think the Instagram is Chris Bale or Chris in. Awakened and Chris Bale Awakened, I think. Is, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Chris Bale Awakened is, is, the, is the tag for Instagram or the account. And the website is awakenedintent.com. Uh, I try to stay away from these things as much as I can, hence my, my, my confusion. But uh, <laughs> if you just type it into Google, you'll get either Batman or me. Uh, yeah. So easiest way to do it. <laughs> yeah, great. It's, I just double checked that's Chris Bar Awakened for those listening. But uh, yeah, fully aware that you post there, but you're not there, which is an awesome, awesome thing that many of us could uh, follow up with. Mate, so good to talk to you and really appreciate the work that you do and have done for years. You bring such a unique, yeah, a unique outlook and unique touch to the, what well, well, I guess where I spent so much time in the men's space. And yeah, the way that you show up is is incredible. So I appreciate you you coming on the podcast today and the work that you do. Thank you, man. I, I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. And and thank you for just letting me speak and share. I, I can get into trains of expression sometimes. So uh, thank you for your, your patience and all of that. Thanks again, brother. <laughs>